Thanks so much, everyone. You've helped me reach 40,000 subscribers. Well, it's like 46,000 now. I was hoping to get this video out faster, like much faster, so much so that this video was recorded before I had a working dynamic overlay in Generation 3. By the way, November is going to feature a few projects like this that I started ages ago and I'm now able to finally finish off. So this video is to say thanks for all the support, and as a result, it's going to be a bit more casual than usual, because it's also going to be a Q&A video. In it, I'm going to attempt to answer nearly every question that was left for me on a post that I made ages ago. At the same time, I'm going to beat the game with only a Jirachi. Of course, I'll talk about all the important battles, and I'll make sure to conclude all the viewer questions before the league starts. So, let's do this. By the way, the rules, the software I use, a guide for changing starters, and a lot of other important info is in the description, so check it out if you're interested. So, Jirachi! This is such a cute mythical Pokémon, and its name is based on the concept of wishing on a star. That's why it looks like a star, by the way. So, I name it Starbuck after my fiancé's favorite place to buy overpriced things. It's also after a character in one of my favorite TV shows from the early 2000s, Battlestar Galactica. I'll confess it, I'm a nerd. I do make Pokémon videos for a living, after all. Now, Drachi might be based on wishes and good fortune, but recording this video really did not start off that way. I had to restart the playthrough three times because OBS corrupted my footage over and over. Finally, I got it to work, but one section of this video did corrupt. However, it's a very short segment, and I'm sorry about that. I'll be sure to mention it when we get there. By the way, many of you mentioned in the comments that taking a female Pokemon through these runs in Generation 3 could be beneficial, especially against Flannery. I'll be thinking about that in the future, but today it isn't relevant. As a mythical Pokemon, Drachi has the same base stat distribution as a Pokemon like Mew or Celebi that came before it. It's 100 in each stat. Its ability, Serene Grace, doubles the chance of a move's secondary effect being triggered. For example, Jirachi has a 20% chance to paralyze with Thunderbolt, and a 20% chance to lower special defense with Psychic, as opposed to the usual 10%. The move I really wanted to use here was Body Slam. 60% chance to paralyze would be amazing. However, this move is walled off by the Battle Frontier, so unfortunately, I'm not going to have access to it today. Jirachi also does have a lot of really good moves. It gets Wish, Confusion, Rest, my favorite, Psychic, rest again, I'm a happy man, and double edge, I'm less happy now, recoil sucks. Its TM move pool is expansive, water pulse, calm mind, toxic, yes this steel type learns toxic, I know all Pokemon do but it always feels strange with steel types. Hidden power, sunny day, hyper beam, light screen, protect, rain dance, thunderbolt, return, psychic, shadow ball, reflect, shockwave, sandstorm, aerial ace, secret power, and rest. Again, rest appears three times in its move pool. This uh, has to be the perfect Pokemon. Making perfection even better are standout moves like Psychic and Calm Mind. Those two are going to get a lot of use today. Notably absent though are any damage dealing steel moves. Well, except for the most metal move ever, Doom Desire. <laughs> I love the name of this move, it's so great. It's fitting that this thing is 120 base power. I looked it up though and I was greeted by this delightful wall of text. On the turn the Doom Desire is selected, this attack will do nothing other than state that the user has chosen Doom Desire as its destiny. Two turns later, Doom Desire will do damage against the target. Okay, but wait, it gets better, because this move is not impacted by type effectiveness, and it also doesn't receive the same type attack bonus. So yeah, it's like Future Sight. This move is just terrible, and obviously I'm not going to be using it today. So that means Drachi doesn't have access to any stab steal moves. Now, I'm new to Generation 3, so I had no idea what the move Cosmic Power did. It raises defense and special defense, and that would be useful if Drachi was defensively frail, but all its stats are balanced, and it has the single best defensive type in the game. Just look at Steel's resistances. It resists 11 types, and it's immune to 1. That's 70% of the typing in the game. It only has 3 weaknesses to fighting fire and ground, but Jirachi is a dual type with psychic type on its side, it isn't weak to the fighting moves, but it does gain weaknesses to ghost and dark types, for a total of 4 single weaknesses. Or it should. That's a modern Jirachi. In Generation 3, Steel resists both ghost and dark, meaning just like fighting, they only do neutral damage, leaving Jirachi with only 2 weaknesses, fire and ground. So what nature is my Jirachi going to have? Well, in Generation 4, Game Freak introduced the Physical Special Split, where the stat used to calculate damage was determined by the individual move, but before that, the stat that calculates the move's damage was determined by the type of move it was. 
So Jirachi's weaknesses are split. Ground is a physical type and fire is a special type. I don't want to decrease either of my defense stats as a result. I do think that 100 speed is more than enough for a playthrough though. Plus I get some speed EVs and I get Watson's speed boost. Plus with the lack of steel moves, that means Jirachi is going to be primarily a psychic type user. So in this case, I choose a quiet nature, which raises Jirachi's special attack and lowers its speed. I know you're going to comment like, it's a terrible idea to lower speed, but like it's really not in a solo playthrough. Like... 100 speed is more than enough, believe me. The last thing I need to decide on is what type I want hidden power to be. The way this works is the base power and the type of hidden power are determined by the Pokemon's IVs. This table shows the IVs required to have a base 70 power, hidden power, of each type. I want to select a type that covers at least one of my weaknesses. In the end, I chose hidden power bug because it covers Sydney's entire team. So now I've got a quiet Jirachi with hidden power bug, and I wish I could use it right away. Unfortunately, that's not what the move Wish does. It just heals Jirachi at the end of the next turn. Now, the reason I want hidden power bug is because there's a trainer with a Poochiana in my way immediately. Confusion can't do damage to Poochiana because it's a dark type. So here's the strategy. I have to train with Confusion until I only have 10 PP left. Then I face the trainer, the order of moves here is important, and it's also key that I'm moving first. I use Wish turn 1, setting it up for a heal at the end of the second turn. Then I use Confusion to waste time before healing with Wish. Because I'm at full health and outspeeding, I can choose Rest, which fails, and then I waste the minimum possible turns because I don't want to fall asleep. I can repeat this sequence over and over until all of Jirachi's PP is depleted, and then I'm able to defeat this awful dog with Struggle. I did make a mistake during the battle, so things got a little bit out of sync. Oh well, small amount of time waste. In the end, I run out of moves and smash the Poochiana. So now as I make my way towards Roxanne, let's get into some of the questions. M. Langham asks, Will you do a run with perfect Pokemon with perfect stat experience from the beginning? It would be cool to see how much faster it would be than a normal run. Yeah, I actually planned this exact video last summer, I just haven't had enough time to make it. My idea is to compare a Pokemon that gains stat experience with a Pokemon that doesn't gain stat experience, just to see how much of a difference that makes in one of these playthroughs. I'm always talking about stat experience, and I think it would be good to know just what its impacts are. King T. Calamari asks, what are the plans for this channel's future? Well, since this question was asked, you will have seen a bunch of them. I did a port back with a Pokemon from Generation 2 into Generation 1. If you haven't seen it yet, check out my Mistrevis in Pokemon Yellow video. I also did a big aesthetic touch-up with the overlay, making everything just look a little bit better and a little bit more modern. However, one of the big things that I want to introduce to the channel is different styles of content. And that leads me to the next question. Bayonetta Aran asks, Would you ever consider a Nuzlocke or a Let's Play? So I actually did a Nuzlocke already last October. It was my Halloween special. But I really have planned to release more. I wanted to release one every month starting in January 2022. But I just didn't have time. I had to pour so much time into learning to program so that I could make the dynamic overlay work. And yeah, that just basically killed my Nuzlocke series for an entire year. Hopefully in 2023, I'll be able to start this one up, so I would really like to do Nuzlocke's. I might do a Let's Play for Pokemon Violet. Uh, by the way, the thruster butt guy, he, he's, he's who I'm choosing. I, I really like it. Okay, so let's get back to the playthrough. By the way, when I was filming this footage, I was really bad at the bag trick to get by spinning trainers. So watch out for those fails because I'm not going to mention them as we go through the footage. Now I'm ready for the first gym leader, so let's take on Roxanne. Geodude's first. I go for Confusion, taking it to Orange, and the Rock retaliates with Rock Tomb, which crits, and of course lowers Jirachi's speed. It appears I'm off to a great start. Roxanne is annoying, healing Geodude with a potion, but while my next Confusion doesn't knock it out, Jirachi is still faster and I take it out before it attacks again. This fight is poetry because the second Geodude rhymes with the first one, it plays out exactly the same way. Her ace, Nose Pass, is last. Unfortunately, it's not very good on my eyes. Uh, I hate this thing. <laughs> it uses Harden twice against my special attacker, I will note. Then it uses Block against my solo Pokemon. And finally, it goes for Tackle against my Steel type. Like, this thing really deserves to faint. And Jirachi's still in green when that finally happens. So that's Roxanne. I've earned myself the Stone Badge, and with it, a 10% boost to my attack stat, which, yeah, is not going to be very useful today. So now, let's do some more questions. Yolostrats360 asks, Ah, by the way, Yolostrats360, great name. What's the best stat boosting move in Generation 1? Okay, so definitely Amnesia. Probably Swords Dance is second, and Growth is third. 
Growth deserves a mention here because it gets 6 badge boosts rather than just 3 from Amnesia or Swords Dance, but those moves are much faster because they only take 3 turns to fully set up. I think Amnesia is better than Swords Dance just because it also boosts special defense on the Pokémon, after all it is a unified stat in Generation 1. However, with Pokémon that are already quite fast, and they have strong attack stats, Sword Dance is incredibly good, because you can just use it like once and then sweep their entire team. That being said, I do think that all the setup moves in Generation 1 are good, like very good. Even moves like Harden are quite good. So I actually think the more interesting question here is like, what's the worst stat boosting move in Generation 1? Agility can remove the speed drop inflicted by paralysis, which is really great. Like lately I've had a lot of playthroughs that I've had to use awful moves like hypnosis to get around paralysis. Double team and minimize raise evasion, and this triggers the badge boost glitch six times. Plus it applies it to every single one of your stats. Sharpen is good because it triggers the badge boost glitch six times, as well as raising your attack stat, which is likely the stat you want to use anyways. And that leaves moves that boost defense. I think these moves as a category are definitely the worst ones. Harden, Defense Curl, Withdraw, and Acid Armor. I almost forgot about that last one, like it's very rare that you get a Pokemon that can use it. So which one of these is the worst? And I think that's largely contextual. If your defense stat allows you to survive longer against a Pokemon you're facing, like the Sand Slash in the final battle, I hate that thing, then Acid Armor is the best because it sets up faster. In that case, Harden, Defense Curl, and Withdraw are all tied as the worst stat boosting move. However, if you're facing a special attacker, Acid Armor is actually the worst stat altering move, because it does trigger the badge boost, but it can only do so three times. Honestly though, like I said before, these moves are all incredible. Just like, if you have a stat boosting move, keep it in Generation 1. Okay, I spent way too long on that question. I am not known for being concise after all, so let's move on. Idiom 104 asks, There are certain types in Pokemon that are thought to be powerful and others that are thought to be weak. Have you discovered any newfound appreciation for these weaker types? I.e. fighting, rock, bug, etc. Well, bug has always been my favorite type, so I've always had a lot of appreciation for it. And because I play a lot of Generation 1, I haven't really fallen in love with the fighting type yet. Also, I just don't really like their designs very much. The only rock type Pokemon that I played with in recent videos is Onix, and it was pretty bad. <laughs> However, I'm excited to try the Rhyhorn line out. Uh, look for that video in December. So to summarize, I still love the bug type, I don't really like the fighting type, and I never really have, and the rock type so far has not won me over. Erica Atkins asks about a Venomoth run where it changes types. I actually do plan to do this run in 2023 on a special day, um, you can guess anyways. Um, one of the rules of the run though is going to be that I can't check the summary page for my Venomoth, so I can never actually figure out what type it currently is, other than just taking damage and dealing damage. So yeah, I think it's going to be really fun. Also the Venomoth is going to change type after I beat every major battle. So like I'll beat Misty and then my Venomoth's type will be randomized. I, I think it's going to be really fun. Bad Butt Psycho asks, Hey Scott, if you could design a Gen 9 Pokemon, would it be a new Venomoth form, like a Lolan or Galarian? And what would its typing be? Uh, well, Venomoth looks like it's going to be in the Paldean Pokedex, so I'm actually really hopeful right now that it's going to get a regional form. However, I think the leaks have proven that this is not the case. I don't, I don't know, anyways. We'll see. If I was to design one, I'd probably have to give it the bug type, because I don't think Game Freak would ever take the bug type away from it but I would pair it with fire or electric type, alluding to the fact that moths really like light sources. Skipatronic asks, how do you avoid burnout playing Pokemon Yellow over and over again? I get asked this a lot and it seems like the obvious question, but it's actually an inversion of the question that should be asked, which is, how do you avoid burnout constantly trying new things? I have so many ideas for the type of content that I want to make, and building assets and resources to start up new projects like Nuzlocks, for instance, or for informational videos, or for like a new generation, that drains so much time and it really causes a lot of stress. Playing Pokemon Yellow over and over actually feels very effortless and fun. Whereas playing a new Pokemon game and having to learn everything, like new mechanics, new learn sets, there's just so much. And on top of all that, I have to develop entirely new production systems. That is extremely taxing. In early 2022, I had the plan that I was going to release one Generation 3 video every month, and that just didn't happen. The reason is that Generation 3 was just really hard to start and get into. It caused a lot of stress, and yeah, I'm like finally glad that I'm rolling with it. 
Getting back to your actual question though, I'm uh, not very good at avoiding burnout because I really love working on the channel. Like I spend almost all of my time just working on the channel. After all, this is my full-time job now. I'd never really announced that, but yeah, it has been for like at least four months. So now it's time for my psychic type to face Brawly. All right, I think this is gonna be fine. Machop's first, I use Confusion, but it just barely doesn't get the KO. Machop goes for bulk up, and then at the beginning of the next turn, Brawly uses a super potion healing it, but because I get to move twice in a row, I knock it out. I say no to learning Helping Hand, and then Metatite comes out. The only damage dealing move that this thing has is Focus Punch, so as long as I keep attacking, it won't be able to do anything. Because Confusion is neutral and has Stab, it's obviously the best choice over Swift. Makuhita's last. This fight is taking longer than I was expecting, but that's exclusively because he has potions. In the end, Jirachi doesn't take a single point of damage and Brawly loses. So now it's time for Granite Cave. And as I deliver the letter to Steven, let's get back into questions. Graham Coombe asks, if you could create a new Pokemon type, what would it be and why? I would create the sound type. Check out Wolfie VGC's awesome video on it. Additionally, I'm a musician, so that's why I'd like to see this type introduced. I mean, uh, hear this type introduced. Wendy Diego asks, if you could design your own perfect Pokemon region, what would it be? What Pokemon would you bring from other gens? What kind of starter combos would you like to see? Okay, so I know this is gonna be a really unrealistic answer. Game Freak is never gonna do this. I want the region to be based on Canada, which is where I live. I want the regional bird to be based on the Canada goose because this thing is terrifying. And I also think it would be a great flying fighting type. Like we need something else that has that typing. That typing is great. And I also want a moose Pokemon. Like I really want a moose Pokemon. These things are awesome. I'd obviously bring over Corviknight because we have a lot of ravens here. Deerling has to come over as well because uh, deer are everywhere. And Watchhog because I'm from the prairies and gophers are, yeah, they're like everywhere. Also, the oil and gas industry is extremely large where I live, and so I'd like to see a pollution Pokemon based on oil and gas. I would love to see an oil barrel Pokemon that's like broken open with sludge leaking out. I'm thinking poison steel typing. Also, for starter combinations, Here's what I'm thinking, and I, this is also, I think, Game Freak is never going to do this. I really want to see different combinations of fire, water, and grass. So each could be given the other typing that covers its weakness. For example, water, fire, grass, water, fire, grass. I'd have each of these start as monotypes, and then when they reach their final evolution, they would gain their additional typing. I also think this sort of dynamic would put strategy at the forefront, rather than simply making the starters about rock, paper, scissors. Let me know uh, what you think about this idea in the comments. Anyways, it'd be cool to see. Gallant Striker asks, have you ever completed the Pokedex in any Pokemon games? If so, what was your first and or favorite? I attempted to complete the Pokedex in Pokemon Yellow when I beat it as a kid. I got to around 122. I think that's the last number I remember. And then I couldn't get any more because I didn't have anyone to trade with. Also, I uh, just couldn't figure out where to get a Farfetch'd. Like, <laughs> it's just like so lost. I have completed the Pokedex though, and the first one that I completed was actually Pokemon X and Y. And I got so into Generation 6 that I also completed a Living Dex just before Sun and Moon came out. From there, I completed Living Dexes in Pokemon Sun and Moon, Pokemon Ultra Sun and Moon. Yes, I completed a completely separate Living Dex for these games. I also completed Living Dexes for the Virtual Console releases of Red, Blue, and Yellow, and also the Virtual Console releases of Gold, Silver, and Crystal. It was also uh, so nice to get Celebi in those games, finally after so long. The most recent Living Dex that I've completed was in Sword and Shield before the DLC came out. By the way, I actually haven't finished the DLC for Sword and Shield yet, and uh, yeah, I know there were new Pokemon introduced there. With Pokemon Scarlet and Violet coming out very soon, I'm uh, not sure if I'm going to be able to complete Living Dexes in these games just because I have to make content for this channel now. Um, after all, I'm an adult and I do need to do my job. Okay, so in the playthrough I forgot to get an HM Mule that can use Cut, which means I won't be able to do the Trick House right now, but I will be able to backtrack here and grab it after I finish off Flannery. I'm sort of worried about her, by the way. The rival on this route is pretty challenging, usually that is, and so I should mention the choice that I made way back at the beginning of the game. I chose to start as the female character, and this is so the rival at this location picks a different team. When I was doing my Swampert playthrough, which I was not intending to release when I first wrote the script for this video, but yeah, it's, it's out now, so you can go and watch it. I actually figured that out in that video, and this is one of the reasons that speedrunners don't have a problem with this fight. Here, Brendan leads with Wingull, I use Confusion, and it almost KOs. Drachi gets confused, doesn't hit itself, and knocks the Wingull out next. 
Okay, it's time for the Combuskin. Now, I'm very afraid of this Pokemon. Drudgey snaps out of confusion and sends it right back at Brendan's team. It takes Combuskin to red, and then the chicken uses focus energy. Okay, that's perfect. I knock it out on the next turn, and the only Pokemon left for me to defeat is Lombre. This thing's really easy to mop up, and now Drachi's moving on to the third gym. Watson leads with Voltorb, and it's fast. It moves first, uses Shockwave, and does a little bit. Drachi's level 20 now, so I have Psychic. It takes the Electric type to red health, lowering Voltorb's special defense in the process. Watson uses a Super Potion, but because of the special defense drop, I knock it out on the next turn. Next is Electric. I go for Psychic, and it gets the KO. But now it's time for the Magneton. This thing is very intimidating because it has the Steel type. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, this is the most defensive typing in the entire series. Psychic is obviously my best choice here, so I use it, and it does about one third. Luckily, it lowers Magneton's special defense, but then the bolts strike back with Thunder Wave, paralyzing Jirachi. I think this is my least favorite status condition, by the way. I, I really hate paralysis. In this case, I prepared for this move. I eat my cherry berry, and that heals the paralysis. My next psychic gets a crit, and that knocks the Magneton out. So that was really lucky. Fitting, because I'm using a Jirachi. Manectrix last. It's faster moving first using Thunder Wave. Jirachi still gets its attack in, doing just under half. Shockwave hits, taking me to half. My next psychic takes the Manectric to low red health, and this triggers its Citrus Berry but the special defense drop is enough, and I take it out on the next turn. Watson is no more. All right, so with the legendary Pokemon, as expected, the first three gyms are quite easy. And that gives me more time for questions. And uh, I can't pronounce this guy's name, but he asks, will Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres be in a triple race, like the Kanto Starters video? Yes, so will the Kanto Eeveelutions and the Johto Legendary Beasts. I do have different plans for the Johto Starters, though. I'll be racing Typhlosion against Charizard, for Alligator against Blastoise, and Venusaur against Meganium. Dark Places asks, How many people work on your videos? Right now, it ranges anywhere from 2 to 10 people. For most projects, it's about 3. Sean, he's my video editor. Serena, she does all the art for the channel. Also, she is not my fiancé. She was just a viewer who submitted fan art. I really liked it. And then I started commissioning her to make more art for the channel. And then finally, of course, myself. Sometimes there's some like video editing or programming done by other people, but usually it's just three. Fabio asks, what software do you use to put the Pokemon data on the overlay? It's called Gamehook. What it does is retrieve the real-time data from the game's RAM and provides it to an API, which I can access. I designed all the visual graphics in Photoshop and Illustrator, and then I'm able to add the data to them with HTML code. For any calculations that I need to calculate manually, like badge boosts, I use JavaScript. I had to learn how to code to make all this happen, by the way. Plus, I had a lot of help from a personal friend, as well as the developer of Gamehook. I think we've become quite good friends now because we've spent a lot of time together working on this program. Pan Naps asks, how do you pace yourself with these videos? I understand a lot of your runs tend to be a bit over an hour, but do you space out your runs or do you even go back to back every now and then? To answer it, I need to explain a little bit about my recording process and my setup. When I record, I don't play the entire playthrough unbroken. I tend to stop, write notes, or flush out large sections of the script while I'm playing, and then I resume the game and continue from the point that I stopped at. Memory is something that I've always struggled with, probably because I have ADHD, and so remembering what happened in a playthrough is tricky if I don't write it down immediately. Also, the idea of scrubbing through hours of footage to remember what happens just feels like it would boil my brain. I cannot stand that. For example, when I record a solo Generation 1 video, my first playthrough and testing takes roughly 8 hours to film and write notes on. It tends to be the case historically that that has been my Monday mornings. I wake up and get this section of the video production out of the way before the rest of the week. On Tuesday, I'll come back, reflect on my results, and then do the second playthrough. For Versus videos, it is a bit different because I usually play the initial playthrough how I do with all my other playthroughs, and then on the second day I'll just do back-to-back -back playthroughs while I optimize. Sometimes in like Hitmonchan's case I did like four playthroughs in one day, then I came back on a third day and did more playthroughs. I do think it's worth noting that in Versus videos I actually do write the video after I've done all of the playing, so I don't do any scripting as I go. Hans Van asks, what is your playtime to editing time ratio? That's a really hard question to answer, by the way, because Sean, my video editor, does the bulk of the video editing now. Sean says on average, each video takes him around 14 hours to edit, so that's generally like two days of work. The vast majority of my time right now goes into scripting, as well as software development and playing. 
For example, the Nidoran female script with Van Man was around 13,000 words, and it was written over three days, and the Polyrath vs. Hypno script from a long time ago was 17,000 words, and it was written over two days. Turns out that I, on average, write about 40,000 words every month. So yeah, I write a novel every two months. It's uh... <laughs> And then I also play the game and develop software. Yeah, I'm like, doing a lot of stuff. The ratio of scripting to playtime used to be around 4 to 1, so if the playthrough took me an hour, the script would take me 4 hours. That's changed recently because I changed my process dramatically, so that time has come down significantly. Right now my writing rate is about 3,000 words per hour, so most of my videos are around 9,000 words, and I get that done in about 3 hours of work. Then after Sean has spent his time editing the video, I'll spend my own time editing the video and polishing it up, then we collaborate together, do some final edits, and then finally it gets released. It's also worth noting that some videos take much longer to edit than others. After we concluded the Nidoran female project, Sean said to me that the version number that we have on the file, the Premiere Pro file that is, is a good indicator of how painful the edit was. Because if it's like 7 or 9 or something like that, it's like not a very painful edit. But with the Nidoran female video, it was like 33 or something like that. It was like, oh, that video was hard. By the way, that's why I missed a week of releases during that period. It's also the case that Versus videos tend to fall into this category. They take so long to film and script that our editing practices are at a far higher standard by the time we're ready to produce the video, and that means we have to go back and do a lot of fixing in post on the original footage, which wastes so much time. It is just like five times faster to film the thing in perfectly the first time rather than fixing it in post. If it takes like five minutes to put it into the software, it will take like four hours to fix it in the footage. So yeah, long-winded process question. I'm sorry I spent so long on that one. Let's move on. TWB28 asks, Have you ever had such bad or good luck in a playthrough that you ever considered scrapping that result as non-indicative of the Pokemon's abilities? I would say that the most ridiculous luck that I ever got in a playthrough was the champion battle in my Ekans playthrough. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. I realized a long time ago, actually back when I did Alakazam vs Gengar, that if I want to have accurate results for placements in my tier list, I need to include several things in all of my videos. One, I need to track real time spent completing the challenge, all the other metrics are not as good. Two, I have to track the number of resets or failures the Pokemon has while it's completing the challenge. Three, I have to do multiple playthroughs with each Pokemon. And four, I have to do more rigorous testing to figure out which strategies are close to optimal. Without these elements, too much error can creep into the results. For instance, tracking only game time means that I would rely on subjective feelings to break ties when Pokemon produce close results. Also, game time is a really weird metric, like I can talk about it for like 4 hours, I've thought about this metric so much. I just don't like it that much, but I provide it in all my videos because people ask about it. After doing two playthroughs with each Pokemon, I feel pretty confident that I have a sense for how it can perform. Just the fact that I did a second playthrough means that any ridiculous luck that appears along the way is sort of accounted for. Really, this is just a long-winded way of saying that if you track all four metrics and do multiple playthroughs, luck becomes a much less important factor in a Pokemon's performance. Devin Fleenor asks three questions. Number one, why are you so entertaining? Uh, it's weaponized awkwardness, that's all it is. Number two, are there any other challenges you think about doing on Pokemon Yellow? Uh, run with the worst moves in the game, Think like Bide, Constrict, Focus Energy, and Razor Wind. Just restrict myself from using all of the good moves and only use moves that are regularly trash that I never use. Number three, Raticate vs. Persian? Question mark. Nope, uh, both of those Pokemon are already spoken for, so uh, yeah, that video can't happen. By the way, I've already paired every single Generation 1 Pokemon with other Pokemon so that I know which versus videos I'm going to make. It just all comes down to when I get the time to actually produce those videos. Gokin asks, have you ever thought of doing Pokemon content outside of these races or doing races outside of Pokemon? Honestly, I'm pretty focused on the main series Pokemon games. I won't be doing any other game franchises on this channel. Maybe games like Stadium in the distant future? Dansplam asks about other races and crossovers, and yes, I'm going to do more of these. I would love to collaborate with more YouTubers. Like, it's just so much fun playing Pokemon with other people. Like, yeah, reach out to me if you're a uh, content creator and you make Pokemon videos and you do, like, Pokemon challenges. I would love to race you. All right, to end off this block of questions, I'll just answer another frequently asked question, which is, will I ever play any ROM hacks? Yes, I do intend to play ROM hacks, but I'm not going to promise a timeline. I'm quite preoccupied with Generation 1, 2, and 3, but I'll get to them eventually. I really can't see it happening though in 2023, so don't hold your breath. New Hope asks, did you enjoy a Pokemon spin-off? I'm actually uh, not sure if you're referring to non-main series games or franchises that are similar to Pokemon. Honestly, 
I have not really enjoyed either of those. I am just very obsessed with the main series games. Like, I've actually never played a Pokemon spin-off game. Although uh, my fiance does love Pokemon Snap. She uh, played that game so much. Devin Miracle asks, if you could be one Pokemon trainer in any gen, which would you be? I would probably be the Bug Elite 4 member from Generation 4. Like, I don't, I don't remember his name, but I, I would want to be that guy. He's Yan Mega. That thing caused me so many problems the first time I played Generation 4 because it has that speed boost ability. Ah, oh, so frustrating. I'd have to be a bug trainer and like, I really don't want to be Bugsy. It's just like having a Kakuna and a Metapod on my team is just, ah. Okay, so let's get back to the playthrough. Now, coming up next is Flannery, and she presents a problem for Jirachi because she has super effective fire-type moves and some ground-type moves. However, I do have a plan for her. In Laveridge Town, there's a move tutor, and he's able to teach Jirachi Mimic. Since I don't have access to Water Pulse yet, I don't have anything that's super effective against her ground and fire-type Pokémon. Both of these types have an advantage over Jirachi. I need to be able to get the upper edge on them in some way. I'm specifically worried about the Torkoal's overheat, so I want to be able to boost my special defense. And it turns out that Flannery's Slugma knows Light Screen, so I figured that I could use Mimic to steal it and boost my special defense. And now I think it's really important to draw your attention to the fact that this playthrough was uh, recorded just after my Swampert playthrough. So yeah, I've had a lot of experience since I first recorded this playthrough. As soon as the fight started, I had this sinking feeling. I'm pretty sure that Mimic doesn't work the way that it works in Generation 1 anymore. I ended up testing Mimic on the Numble to see how it works, but yeah, it works the way it works in Generation 3 and not the way it works in Generation 1. It's uh, really the ultimate nerf to a move. Like Mimic was so good in Generation 1 that it's just like so much worse ever since. Slugma's next, just like Numble, it goes down in a single hit, but Camerupt is probably gonna survive. Since I've mimicked Magnitude, I try it, and maybe I'll get Magnitude 10, but it gets Magnitude 7, which is the average, by the way. The Camerupt survives with orange health, and then it uses Overheat. It does so much to Jirachi, but Fortune is on my side because this little cute star survives with two hit points. Psychic takes the Camel out, and last is Torkoal. Here's the thing though, I've got no way to take it out, he uses Body Slam, and that's it. Alright, so uh, that didn't go very well. In the next fight, I just spam Psychic, Numble, Slugma, and the camera up to go down. Unfortunately, she did get Sunny Day set up though. I try Psychic against the Torkoal, it does more than half, and then it overheats like my iPad on the beach. So yeah, Jirachi is uh, not doing so well here. Okay, let's try to actually mimic Light Screen. Like, if I commit to this, maybe it will work. I knock the Numble out, and then I choose Rest against Slugma, giving it time to set up. It grants my wish by using Light Screen first turn, allowing me to mimic it in the shortest amount of time possible. But then Slugma uses Overheat, gets a critical hit, and Jirachi goes down. So I thought that the Slugma wouldn't be able to deal that much damage. Well, what happens if it doesn't get a crit? Well, it could just use Overheat right away first turn and take Jirachi to orange health. Now, using Rest puts me to sleep, which is unfortunate because Slugma uses Light Screen while I'm asleep, eliminating the ability to mimic it. Overheat misses, Slugma sets up Sunny Day, and without a crit, Jirachi actually doesn't take that much damage. Instead of using Rest again, I use Shockwave so I don't knock the Slugma out this way. It might use Light Screen again, I try again, and this time, Slugma goes for it. Flannery uses a Hyper Potion, I mimic Light Screen for the first time, and I get to set it up. Okay, now I'm ready. Let's do this. Slugma sets up Sunny Day, I use Rest because Overheat has lowered its special attack, and then it fails a Sunny Day and Light Screen. Oh, it ran out of Overheat PP. That makes it an easy knockout, and I'm moving on to the camera. But my Light Screen fades the turn it comes out, Flannery gets Sunny Day while I re-establish my Light Screen, my Psychic does very little because she has Light Screen on the field, but at least I lower camera up's special defense. Her Light Screen wears off, and Psychic gets the KO. Torkoal is all that's left. Psychic does half, the turtle uses Body Slam. Ah, uh, why did it do that? Like, it seems like a good play now because it paralyzed me. It goes for Body Slam again, and then Psychic knocks it out. Okay, I made it past her. By the way, I gotta thank Leary for her suggestion to use Light Screen here. I didn't even know about the Mimic Tutor. The funny thing is, we both thought Mimic worked the way it did in Generation 1 when she suggested this strategy. Oh well, at least it ended up working out. So there's not much to do between Flannery and Norman. I backtrack through the middle of the map, grabbing strength while I'm on my way. I pick up a Max Ether. Alright, it's time to face the character's dad. Let's do this.
For this fight, I bring in a Chesto Berry. I wanted this because then when I use Rest, I'll wake up right away. By the way, when I was filming this video is when I first learned of the term Resto Chesto. And uh, yeah, I have absolutely love it. It's like my favorite strategy. I really am going to have to use this against Steven to negate the Skarmory's Toxic in the future. I am thinking about that strategy. We'll see it play out soon. Spin does first, and after playing against it just a little bit in Generation 3, I've learned not to underestimate it. Teeter Dance can be quite scary, but today Jirachi deals with it like nothing. Vigoroth's next. Psyche takes it to red, Faint Attack does very little, and I knock it out. Slacking's next. And I make a silly mistake here. I use Mimic first turn so that I don't deal any damage because I thought it might use Counter to deal massive damage back to me. However, uh, yeah, Psychic is a special move, so Counter won't do anything. I should have just attacked. As a result, I take a lot of damage, and I deplete my Psychic PP before I knock it out. Linoon is last, and it loves to set up Belly Drum first. Shockwave doesn't knock it out, but I'm moving first, so after Belly Drum, I can take care of it on the next turn. And with that, I've earned myself the fifth badge. Now I can use Surf. I grab a rare candy from the Trick House that I forgot before, and I also grabbed one across this little pond, and then I head north to Mauville City. Here, I'm going to do the new Mauville plotline so they can get the Thunderbolt TM from Watson. Remember, Serene Grace is really great in combination with this move. Also, Winona's coming up next after all. Plus, there's just so much water, so an Electric-type move is going to be great. Now it's time for more questions. Andrea M. asks, Have you been to Italy? Uh, no, I have not been to Italy before. The only places in Europe that I've been are Austria, Poland, and Hungary. Maybe one day I'll go to Italy and we can have some espresso together. By the way, I don't really drink coffee, so like I'll be a wreck after I have it. <laughs> Gaming with Foss asks, What kind of bands are you into, and what's your favorite genre to play? By the way, Gaming with Foss also makes Pokemon content, so go check them out. The first band that I was ever in did uh, terrible garage band stuff. Like, yeah, it was awful. We played mostly pop punk music. Think like Blink-182 or Sum 41. After that, I was in a couple of metal bands because I got really interested in improving my skill as a guitarist, and uh, power chords weren't that interesting to me anymore. At that time, I was listening to a lot of Children of Bodom and Born of Osiris. However, I got frustrated with other people not taking improving seriously, and so I, uh, I went into classical music, the uh, genre where everyone takes everything way too seriously. So yeah, for roughly the last 15 years, I've played mostly in orchestras. Kangastan, another Poketuber, asks, What is your favorite non-Pokemon content to watch on YouTube? He also asks if my fiance watches my videos. Actually, one time she was having a work meeting and I had to like go past the room, and I was like, Wait, that's my voice, Like, what's going on? Turns out she was showing her colleague my Dragonair video where I announced our engagement. <laughs> so it was, uh, yeah, it was, that was weird. My uh, favorite non-Pokemon content to watch on YouTube is usually educational videos. So many of the skills that I have learned to create this content came directly from YouTube and other platforms like Skillshare or uh, just simple Google search. I also like watching long form movie analysis videos. Think like if the video is like two hours long, it's too short. Like it needs to be like five hours long. And then recently, while I've been coding, I've also been watching a lot of the Lex Friedman podcast, especially when he brings on scientists to discuss space. I love space. Like, please just talk to me about black holes for like four hours. That's what I want in my life. Juniper Glades asks, what are your top albums of all time? I am going to answer this question, but first I have to be a classical musician because uh, in classical music, we don't really have albums, at least the older classical music. So yeah, my favorite piece is a symphony. It's actually uh, my favorite classical genre, and uh, it's sort of like an album. By the way, my favorite symphony is Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony because it's really the piece that inspired me to start writing orchestral music. My favorite album of all time is 10,000 Days by Tool. Uh, I just like love me some 11.8. It's just so neat. And also the track Vicarious is so much fun to play on guitar. Cody M asks, Hi Scott, what are some of your favorite classical pieces of music to play? Also, do you play any Pokemon music? I really like playing anything by Debussy or Ravel. Also, I really like performing Western European contemporary art music. That's like, like worst term ever. Anyways, yeah, I like, if I can like use spoons to play my instrument, I am going to be happy. I think these things are really creatively freeing, and I like capturing the audience's attention with something that's very strange. It's also a really fun performative problem to solve. Like, how can I make this thing that is really like strange and off-putting something that people want to engage with and go like, wow, that's kind of fascinating. Plus also I'm a composer, so I'm like, I better like this music if I don't, like what am I doing? Up until this point, I haven't played any Pokemon music, but I would really like to actually do a music related Pokemon project for this channel. But that's all I'll say for that for now. 
The Danish guy reviews, asks, how did you and your fiance meet? How did you propose? Uh, my proposal was pretty simple. I took her to brunch on Valentine's Day, and then we went for a walk by the river, and that's where I proposed. Uh, we also met through mutual friends, and it was like really awkward. It is definitely a miracle that we like ever even talked. Drope asks like a million questions, so here's some like rapid fire responses. The wedding date is about a year from now. No plans for babies right now, especially baby Pokemon runs. I'll talk about music stuff in a later video. And yes, my fiance is real. That's uh, why I have to keep mentioning her. Drew Fob asks, ever consider doing which game can X Pokemon beat fastest? Where you take a Venomoth into a solo run in red and blue, yellow and crystal, and then compare the times. Yeah, I started doing this between yellow and red. I think this is really neat between these games. I don't know if I'll do any cross-generational comparisons because like, what are we really comparing then? Like, yeah, generation three takes longer. That doesn't seem very interesting to me. Also, I think this type of content only really works if the special release of the game is much different than the original game. So for instance, red and blue and yellow are extremely different, whereas gold and silver and crystal are actually very similar. Like there's not really any interesting comparisons to be made between those games. Jacob Anderson asks, Will you ever do comparison videos between the originals and the remakes, like how good is Hypno in red, blue, and yellow versus Fire Red and Leaf Green? I do intend to play Fire Red and Leaf Green at some point, I won't spoil when, but at some point. But as I said before, I don't intend to make videos where I compare Generation 1 to Generation X. However, since I will be playing every Pokemon introduced in Gen 1 in a Gen 1 game, we will be able to compare the results from Fire Red and Leaf Green to the Generation 1 games when I finally do those playthroughs. Liz asks, you always say you love the older generation games, but what do you think about the newer generation games? Sword and Shield, Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, and Legends Arceus. First of all, let me just say that my fiance absolutely loved Legends Arceus, and so did I. Allowing the player to feel like they have control of the character more often, and like not having to like pause the gameplay constantly, was a really refreshing thing to have featured in one of these games. For instance, in previous versions, when you pick up an item, there's a text box that you can't get around. It just pauses the game. It's like awful. It's like, I know what I picked up. Can you just like have a pop-up that shows up on the screen while I'm moving around? That would be really nice. In Legends Arceus, obviously you can do this because you like throw your Pokemon out and they go like harvest something for you. Just great. Please can we have more of that? It's just really awesome. In general though, uh, Sword and Shield, Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, these are probably some of my least favorite Pokemon games of all time. Like, I haven't really talked about it before, but Generation 4 is my least favorite generation of all Pokemon games. So yeah, Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, no, uh, no positive reviews coming from me for those games. Beyond that, for new games that have been introduced to the series, Sword and Shield are like probably my least favorite of any generation. I played through them like two times, and that is the least number of playthroughs I've ever done of any generation of Pokemon game. I'm really excited to see what they do with Generation 9. Hopefully it impresses me. After all, I really liked the 3DS games. Sun and Moon were some of my favorite Pokemon games of all time. So now it's time to battle Winona. Swablu's first, I choose Thunderbolt and it gets the KO. Okay, that's good because that thing has Perish Song. Winona sends in Altaria next, it's part Dragon type so I choose to use Psychic instead of Thunderbolt, it does less than half and Altaria sets up Dragon Dance. That's really not good. Dragon Dance is a terrifying move. As a result, it's now moving first and it sets up another Dragon Dance before getting hit by a second Psychic. It heals with an Orinberry. Okay, uh, let's pause there. Orinberry? Why does Winona have an Orinberry? I looked this up by the way and like, of all of the gym leaders, she's one of the only ones that has an Orenberry. Like, even Brawly has a Citrus Berry. What is going on? Anyways, let's resume. Winona heals with a Hyper Potion, taking Altaria to full health. Alright, so this isn't going well. It's got set up and it's healed. So the question is, how much damage will Altaria do when it attacks? Well, after setting up a third Dragon Dance, it finally goes for Earthquake, which does so much damage. But Jirachi survives on Orange and knocks it out. Okay, I love rest, because now I can heal. I still have my Chesto Berry from the last fight, so I wake up right away and I'm able to attack the Tropius with Thunderbolt on the next turn. Skarmory is a one hit for once, this thing is so annoying. Next is Pelipper, and this thing obviously is annoying too, it trolls me with Protect, but that doesn't stop me from defeating it. I think that if Altaria was less greedy with its setup, I wouldn't have got through that fight. Anyways, for now, I'm moving on.
And at this point, this is where my footage corrupted. I went up Mount Pyre and grabbed Shadow Ball and beat a bunch of Aqua Grunts. So nothing that important. Now let's get back to questions. Mike Wilkinson asks, what inspired you to be in content creation? How difficult was it to get off the ground and get a following? So I've kind of always been in content creation, like going way back, I was making YouTube videos when I was like 14 years old. I guess that's like 16 years ago now. There were videos of me and my garage band playing a bunch of metal music. Honestly, it's like a uh, pretty cringy stuff. There was one video specifically where my uh, friend was reading the lyrics off of a notebook. He was trying to hide the fact that he was reading them off a notebook. Like, ah, oh, so awful. I'm so sorry if anyone ever saw that. Then after that, I streamed StarCraft II when I was in university, and I actually made a few YouTube videos about that, focusing on the game and how to improve your skills. By the way, I was a Protoss player, so I didn't have any skills myself. <laughs> no, uh, no wonder I never got a following making that content. In 2015, I was actually watching a lot of Birdkeeper Toby and other Pokemon Theories channels, also a lot of top 10 content. So back in 2016, I decided to make this channel with the intent of making top 10 videos and Pokemon Theory videos. Honestly, I didn't release any content on this channel though, because I didn't know how to do video editing and it was just way too intimidating. The thing that finally got me off the ground was changing my perspective around it. I just said, I want to learn video editing, so I'm going to make some videos. I expected each video to get a total of zero views, and I figured the learning process would just be fun. Knowing that I would fail, I wasn't scared to start anymore, so I made my first video here, which was my solo Butterfree video. To this day, I'm like really grateful, but I also find it a bit strange that I have a following. Like, I got really lucky. At this point now, I love what I do so much. Like, Monday is my favorite day when I can just sit down and start working on a new video. I am so grateful that all of you are supporting me and watching my stuff, like it means the world to me. If the viewership just dried up tomorrow and no one was watching anymore, I would still at least complete my Pokemon Yellow series, and I would just like have to find a way to make that financially viable. Not a Flamingo asks, when are we getting another masterpiece like the Grimer video? Possibly in the Muck video? Probably never. I will explain why, but for those of you that don't know, my Grimer video is really cringy because I left in a lot of my outtakes. Like I actually filmed good takes of all the lines, but then I just didn't put them in because I was like, ah, it'll be funny if I leave in all of these like flubbed lines. People will laugh, it'll feel more real. Now that I have more experience, this feels really like a creative dead end for me. In the APOM video, which immediately preceded the Grimer video, I was starting to experiment with adding bloopers into the main video, and my goal here was to remove the blooper section at the end of the video, because I wanted to unify the viewing experience, and I also wanted to prevent people from just like clicking off the video at the end, which is like never good for the algorithm. Turns out the reception to the APOM video was very good. Like, I got a lot of comments saying like, oh, this one feels like so fun and funny and like, it's awesome. So yeah, I just pushed things much further in the Grimer video, assuming that I was going in the right direction. Turns out that wasn't the case, so I just course corrected immediately after realizing that this wasn't a good creative route. I'm sure that in the future I'm going to go down another creative dead end, and all of you will let me know when that happens. This is just one of the risks that you take as a creative person when you're always trying to improve things, make them better, and change things up. Brooker Boom asks, What would be your tip to people who are getting into content creation like you? Something you wish you knew before you started. I wish that I had known how hard it would be to manage everything that's required for this job. I am constantly juggling playing through the game, editing the videos, writing scripts, developing software, testing software, learning programming, learning illustration, learning Excel, reading comments, reading Discord, updating YouTube, updating Patreon, emailing sponsors, responding to viewer emails, sending materials to my video editor, having meetings with my video editor, talking to people to work on scripts, working on scripts with other people, and also finishing the videos and like doing quality control on them like it is a lot of stuff to go through and I am sure that that is not all of it so what would be my tip for someone who's getting into content creation I'd say learn how to say no I'm not referring to how to say no to other people because yes that is important and yes it is hard to say no to other people in some circumstances but that isn't really how I struggle with it what I would say is learn how to say no to your own ideas Every day, I have hundreds of ideas about how to make these videos better. I have hundreds of ideas about what would be a cool new video to create. For so long, 
I just wasn't able to say no to these ideas, and I pursued as many of them as I could every single day. And this left me so exhausted, overworked, and it also left so many videos unfinished like this video. What that leads to is creative dissatisfaction because it's like I can see how much there could be and how great it could be, but I just can't get there right now. I'm trying to be too perfect or to do too many things all at once. It's really hard to let go of your ideas because usually we identify with them and we think that they're really good, but it's very important to just be like, no, I'm not doing any of these things that I really want to do. I'm doing this one thing right now. I'm going to get it done and put it out there for people, even if it isn't perfect. Because all of this comes down to a truth that I've learned during my time as a content creator and as a musician. Ideas don't matter. The only thing that actually matters is excellence in execution. So say no to the vast majority of the ideas that you have. Choose which ones you pursue extremely carefully and focus intensely on the ones you do choose so that you can execute them excellently. Now that I've finished all the hideouts, I'm ready to face Tate and Liza. This typically has been the hardest spot for me in most solo challenges because my single Pokemon has to beat two other Pokemon at the same time. Here's the thing, remember back at the beginning of the video when I said I wouldn't use cosmic power? Yeah, it's actually going to be useful here. I want to get fully set up so that I don't take very much damage. After that, I can heal with rest and then knock them out slowly. As I set up, Claydol attacks with Earthquake and Zatu sets up with its own Calm Minds. A Citrus Berry prolongs the amount of time that I can set up and after that I can use rest and finally I'm ready to attack with Thunderbolt. Here's the issue. Claydol resists Psychic, Zatu resists Psychic, Claydol's immune to Thunderbolt, and while Zatu is weak to it, it just set up a bunch of Calm Minds. Yes, I did in fact accidentally use Thunderbolt there on Claydol. Whoops, I am known to make mistakes. I heal one more time before I get my first real hit in, and then when I do I see the damage and yeah, oh no, this is gonna take a while. Well, while we watch the fight, I might as well answer some more questions. Alan Tremaine asks, what keeps you going during the third and fourth runs of these challenge videos? Once you've beaten it and tried another strategy, how do you summon the wheel to sit through yellow once or twice more with the same Pokemon? Pulsing Nova also asked a similar question, so here's the answer. Honestly, it's sort of the exact opposite. The playthrough actually gets more engaging the more I do, because I'm like wanting to beat my time even more and optimize as much as is possible. The first playthrough is always the least satisfying for me, and after I've tested it a bit, I really want to do another playthrough to see just how much time that cuts. And finally, when I start doing repeated playthroughs, I'm just trying to push myself to execute perfectly, and that's very fun. I'm a musician, and this sort of process is sort of like rehearsing a piece over and over, making small improvements, and coming back and trying again in another performance of it. Honestly, now though, with a rooting software that calculates things like precise damage ranges, it's getting much easier to come to a strategy that just works and is very consistent quite fast. I don't see myself really needing to do like 7 to 14 playthroughs anymore. That's kind of like old Scott's thoughts. I just think that I can optimize the Pokemon much quicker now that I have the tools. Andrew Vandiver asks, what motivates you to get through a playthrough with a bad Pokemon? I watched Coughing and Ekans, and I was astounded that despite how bad they are, you still got through it. So to answer this question, I think I need to go a little bit more in-depth, like all my answers, like I'm so long-winded. <laughs> I guess more content for all of you, right? So let's separate out the category of bad Pokemon into four different subcategories. Category 1 are Pokemon that are monotonous to use. Think of Pokemon like Abra or, say, Magikarp. Category 2 are Pokemon that have awful base stats, typing, move pool, or growth rate. Think about a Pokemon like Ekans or Coughing. Category 3 are Pokemon that initially seem good, but because of something like typing or move pool, etc., they end up performing poorly, like Seal. And the final category, which is Category 4, are Pokemon that require luck to win. Think like Gengar against the champion because it has to use Hypnosis in Yellow version. For Category 1, I can just put on long-form content while I grind with a Pokemon like Abra trying to beat Brock. This isn't very frustrating, it's actually just kind of relaxing. Also, going into these runs, you expect that it's going to be like this, so it doesn't really feel all that bad. It actually felt amazing once Abra started sweeping everything. For Category 2, I actually don't find these Pokemon frustrating either because I have such low expectations going in. I'm like, yeah, this is going to be awful. I'm ready to just suffer. <laughs> and it's fine. Now, Category 3 and 4 are where I get very frustrated. 
expectations don't really help here. If I have high expectations for a Pokemon and it dramatically underperforms like Seal, then I get very frustrated. Something else you will have noticed on my channel, I love optimizations and reliability. Consistency is a word I say a lot. So when a Pokemon requires luck to win, like Gengar, it ends up leaving a bad taste in my mouth, even if its time is objectively fast. So if I know the Pokemon is going to be bad or monotonous, I don't really need motivation because I already know what to expect going in. However, when it underperforms expectations or requires luck, that's when I get truly frustrated. So the answer is really not that a longer playthrough is more frustrating or harder to get through. Even a short playthrough can be frustrating like Gengar when it relies on luck. However, Category 3 is really where I suffer. Like, when I have high expectations of a Pokemon like Swampert or Seal, it usually ends up in the case where I just put the project down, walk away from it for a week or two, and then have to pick it up later on when it's more creatively exciting for me again. Ian Takala asks, You said that Gengar vs Alakazam is your worst video due to submitting a suboptimal strategy and sticking with it, and it also manifested in the Hypno vs Polyrath video. Would you say there are any biases in your now developed playstyle? whenever you test these things scientifically, such as really preferring unnecessarily safe moves or rushing beyond four times speed up mistakes. I think there are a lot of biases in my playstyle and I'm constantly trying to evaluate them and make different decisions. Here's some examples. One, I really dislike using moves like takedown and double edge because of recoil damage. Uh, no, submission is not one of these moves. That move is officially trash. In my Nidoran video with Vanman, I discovered that my bias against Double Edge really made my Nidoran underperform, so since then I've been really trying to use this move in more situations. My second bias is I extensively rely on Rest against the Champion in Yellow, when some Pokémon likely don't need it, and I could just skip it entirely saving some time. However, this one's a bit hard to get away from, because the Yellow Champion functions in a way where Rest genuinely makes him significantly easier for almost every Pokémon. After his first two offensively strong Pokemon go down, Executor is just the perfect opportunity to heal up before the fight continues. In second playthroughs, I'm trying to objectively evaluate if rest is required, and if not, I leave it behind. My third bias is that I generally avoid moves that don't have 100% accuracy. This means that sometimes I'll skip over a powerful move like Fire Blast when teaching it would be the better choice. I'm hoping that the rooting software allows me to see through this and use moves that have lower accuracy when they are the best choice. My fourth bias is that I really like the rocket hideout for an extra rare candy and extra vitamins. Even though it's not always strictly required, playing Pokemon Red and Blue is really teaching me this because Rest and the rocket hideout are not required in those games. There's also many more that I can think of, but I'll talk about those later. Hopefully you'll see that my play will evolve over time. However, it isn't evolving in a vacuum, so I am always evolving to try and do the best strategies in whichever game that I am playing. All right, so like, let's get back to the fight. It looks like it's starting to wind down now. Not exactly how I expected. I've realized by this point that there's no way to defeat the clay doll without struggle. So what I need to do is start preparing for that. Every time I use rest, I want to spend my health spamming out the PP for cosmic power. Because believe me, it has a lot. By this point, the clay doll is struggling, so it might knock itself out with recoil damage. Lunatone will soon be suffering a similar fate, but it has to spam out a bunch of status moves first before it can actually attack. Thrilling, I know, this fight is just so engaging. Usually when I record these challenges, each battle takes around 30 seconds to like 2 minutes in the worst case scenario. Any battle that goes longer than that is exceptionally long. But in this case, we are now at 6 minutes of real time spent in a single battle. Alright, uh, since it's not wrapping up anytime soon, I'll answer some more questions. Just some short ones though. Hopefully this fight doesn't take too much longer. Haven asks, what's the most frustrating run that you've done, and what other games do you play besides Pokemon? Seal is the most frustrating run I've ever done, followed closely by Swampert. I really disliked both of those playthroughs. Also, there is one other playthrough that I have not yet released yet. It's an old one. It's my first triple digits resets. And uh, yeah, it was extremely frustrating. So that one's hopefully coming soon in November. By the way, when it comes to games that I play other than Pokemon, I don't really play games other than Pokemon. Like I pretty much only play Pokemon right now. <laughs> I, I really love these games. I'm like so obsessed. Okay, looks like the battle's still not wrapping up, so I've got time for another question. Cory Van Eppern asks, Is there something up in the water in Canada that turns out solid Poketubers? I don't actually think it's something in the water. I think it's the water's state. Mostly it's frozen, and that incentivizes us to stay inside and play video games. D-Man asks, Could we ever hope to see modded Gen 1 runs, such as ones that add a future generation Pokemon for hypothetical purposes? 
Yes, we just saw Mischievous from Generation 2, and I will make more of these if you're interested in them. Honestly, it's a really fun project for me to work on, so I'm hoping that you like them because I would like to make more. Okay, so back to the battle just after the 7 minute mark here. Claydol knocks itself out with recoil, and I've still got some power points left of cosmic power. Lunatones being really annoying with hypnosis and putting Jirachi to sleep. I think in the history of this channel, this is the longest fight that I've ever had. What a stall fest. However, I really don't want to give up because this is Jirachi's first attempt against Tate and Liza. And uh, yeah, up until this point when I was filming this, I had never had a solo playthrough of Emerald where I beat them on the first attempt. So I was dedicated. I wanted this to be it. So we've come to the moment. I only have one PP left and it's rest. I saved this for last so that I have as much possible health before I start to struggle. With my PP fully depleted, and I mean fully depleted, the struggle begins. When I hit Lunatone for the first time, it does quite a bit of damage, so I'm only going to require one more hit. And with that, I've done it. Tate and Liza have been defeated in the first battle, albeit taking 8 minutes of real time. I could do like 15 resets in this amount of time by the way, so that's sort of ridiculous. It was worth it though because the prize for winning is the TM for Calm Mind. While Cosmic Power was nice for that fight, I don't want to be using it anymore. It's time to boost my offensive stats. Next is this mandatory double battle where you team up with Steven. I usually don't pay much attention to it, but today I start to get a bit worried. The camera ups are setting up a lot of amnesias, and then Earthquake hits me and takes me into orange. Luckily, I've got to face a Golbat and a Crobat now, and Wing Attack doesn't do very much. With them out of the way, Mighty Anna's last. It's giving me flashbacks to that Poochyena at the very beginning of the video but this time I have Thunderbolt. As a result, I can knock it out with a single hit. Okay, so it's time for more plot now. Let's get back into the questions. Matt K asks, did you ever think about doing your videos in parts? How would it be if let's say you posted your first unoptimized run? After that, you read the comments from people on how to improve and do a follow-up video with the improvements. It'll get more views and keep watchers engaged thinking about better ways to play. You'll get more comments and truly optimize the runs. Initially, this was actually the format that I wanted to use, but Roy, my script editor at the time, counseled me against it, thinking that people wouldn't want to watch multiple videos for the same Pokemon. And then, in my experience, when I posted some follow-up videos, the second video always performs much worse than the first. So much so that it doesn't make sense, like, as a business or as, like, a person that has, like, a life to produce a whole second video on the same Pokemon. I also find this approach creatively less fulfilling because it's not self-contained content. Like, my goal would be to make a video in whatever game with one Pokemon, and, like, that is the only video I ever need to make for that Pokemon. It's just, like, its own little self-contained universe with everything related to that Pokemon in it. I'm still working towards this ideal and hopefully one day I'll get there. All right, so now I'm gonna address a question that I've answered before, but I still get this question so much. So that's, will I ever play any generation four, five, six, anything else? Yes, I will. I am planning to play every generation eventually, as long as people are still here watching. As I go, I really only wanna have one new generation that I'm learning, while all of the other generations I already know pretty well. So right now I'm learning Generation 3, and Generation 1 and 2 I know quite well. So now I've made it to Wands Gym. I've talked about it before in Generation 3, but it's hard to navigate the overworld. I really thought that these ice puzzles would be an extreme challenge, but they're actually not that bad, because you just have to walk inside. Certainly they're a lot easier to skip than the spinning trainers, but I've learned that I should just fight them now anyways. With the puzzles behind me, now it's time to face Wan. Love Disc is first, the most terrifying lead that any gym leader has in any Pokemon game. Fact. Well, I guess it can confuse me with Water Pulse, and that's really annoying. Eventually, I get Calm Mind in, and with that, I knock it out with Thunderbolt. Whiskash is next. I used to always hit this thing with Thunderbolt as a kid. Look at it, it's a fish and it's blue. But now, I know better. Psychic finishes it in a single hit, Thunderbolt 1 hits Celio and Crawdont, and then Juan only has his ace left. But Kingdra is quite terrifying. I've lost to it before, with Sceptile actually, and that really didn't feel good. Today though, Thunderbolt gets the job done. Jirachi's off to Victory Road. It's so easy to get lost in this place. While I do that, I'll uh, get back to answering some more questions. This is going to be the final block of questions, so thank you so much for everyone who submitted a question. Hopefully this has been interesting for all of you. Aaron Charlton asks, If you didn't find Pokemon, what other game slash hobby from your youth do you think would have captivated you the same way Pokemon did? Well, uh, I was pretty captivated by the StarCraft games, I think largely because they're about strategy, fast execution, and competition. 
When I was 13, I actually wanted to be a professional StarCraft Brew War player. I ended up playing on a small local team in StarCraft II during my years at university. Our sponsor actually helped me get a lot of the computer components that I used at the start of making these videos for this channel. I'm going to slightly rephrase the question that Work in Progress X asked. So here it is. What do you think is the best and worst types for a solo run? Well, if I address this question specifically from the context of Pokemon Yellow, eventually I'll actually have data on this and we'll be able to know objectively. But for now, I'll just guess. I think that water type is likely the second best typing behind the obvious choice, which is psychic. If I had to pick a third best type, my third best type would probably be normal. And that's just because they have wide move pools in generation one. I think the worst type is clearly poison type. So far, almost all of the poison Pokemon that have completed playthroughs with have been underwhelming. The exceptions there being Gengar, Golbat, and Bellsprout, but those three really shine because of their secondary typing, not because of their poison typing. I also think that fighting is the second worst type, like fighting is just trash in generation one. Jinjo Cold Humor asks, how would you buff Onyx? For this one, I'm going to stick with an answer that I think keeps Onyx in the same role that it currently has as a wall. I'd make its special defense equal to its defense, giving it a chance to survive four times water and grass moves. Additionally, I'd probably raise its HP just slightly so that it has the ability to survive even more hits. Obviously though, if I completely redesigned it, I'd probably just buff its attack stat and leave it at that. But I do feel that that changes the spirit of Onyx, and I don't really want to do that. Jazzy asks, what's your big plan for when the challenge decks for yellow is complete? Well, there's still games in Generation 1 to complete, like red and blue. I also don't know if I want to complete challenge decks in Gen 2 and 3, but those games as well. I have a lot of ideas for challenges in Generation 1 that aren't solo challenges, so I would like to do those as well. So yeah, don't worry, Generation 1 content is not going anywhere anytime soon, even once I've completed all 151 Pokemon. Science asks, it's a strange saying that. If Pokemon could make a new game that would be perfect for you, what would it be like? Honestly, if I'm uh, going for low-hanging fruit here, just please allow me to skip cutscenes. Two other changes that I would really want are instant dialogue, so basically you can skip the dialogue, and also speeding up the pace of battles. What I'm thinking is like make the time between each battle decision like one-tenth of what it is currently. For instance, make Pokemon attack each other simultaneously so that animations render at the same time and allow the player to choose the next move at the tail end of these animations. This could be done visually without impacting how battles function mathematically. When you play a first person shooter, for example, the player is constantly making choices and never waiting for the game to just like do something. I think that Pokemon should really strive to be more like this so that it keeps players engaged. I'm also always thinking about this in my videos, like I'm trying to always have something on screen that visually engages you, because our brains generally get bored if nothing is happening. Johnny Rank asks, if you could change one thing about the mechanics of yellow to make it better, what would it be? I have a very simple answer for this. I would remove items from all of the AI trainers. In so many different situations, the removal of these items would make the game much harder. I really enjoy all of the Gen 1 jank, so yeah, I would just leave it all there except these annoying items. I got another question like this from Bob Kelly, but he also asks about Crystal and Emerald, so I'll answer for those games now. For Crystal, I just rescale all the levels, especially for Kanto so that that portion of the game was extra difficult. For Emerald, I'd remove spinning trainers because they're awful, like they are no fun, let's just take them out. Another PokeTuber, Coach Max Entertainment, asks, will I ever be as cool as you? Well, I think you're pretty cool, cool enough that everyone should check out your Pokemon videos, so yeah, go check out his videos. By the way, everyone, I only promote channels that I actually watch myself, so yeah, I'm never gonna like promote something that I'm just like, nah, I don't wanna watch that myself. Acumenium asks, what one move would you add as universal TM, like Toxic, to make any Pokemon run consistently better? I uh, rephrased that one a bit. For whatever strange reason, I feel like this needs to be a normal move. Because almost all Pokemon can learn Takedown and Double Edge, why not make every Pokemon learn Body Slam? I think that that would be a good option. Honestly, two other options here would be Swift or Tri-Attack. Maybe Swift makes the most sense out of these three normal type moves. After all, it does allow you to get by accuracy lowering moves. By the way, the username of the next question with the Z at the end, I love it. Dragon Slayers asks, what's your fastest Brock split of all time? Honestly, I don't remember, but like it's gotta be one of the splits from Red and Blue. Probably Gyarados, that split was so fast. 
Right now it's a little bit hard for me to dig through all my data because it's all in separate files. Although I am working on learning a system that is going to have all this data just in it where I can compare it much more easily. So hopefully that's going to come to the channel sometime in 2023. Ian asks, what one Pokemon would you love to do a run with that you absolutely dread the idea of doing a run with? Uh, a while ago I would have said Smeargle, but I can't say that anymore. It was really fun. I actually want to do it in Generation 3 and Generation 4. Like, I just can't wait to play more Smeargle. Strangely though, I'm actually looking forward to my Magikarp run. It's going to be very monotonous, but I think it might be possible. Red asks, how would you make Bruno's team more challenging? Well, I'll respond with a quote from a bad movie. It's a good question for another time. Cody Graham asks, are you going to do middle evolutions? Yes, I am. Tenfold Gambit asks, what are the most interesting things you've learned about Generation 1 Pokemon since starting? What have you learned that's helped you most in your runs? Well, I'll answer the second part of that question first, and that's how damage rounding works. In Pokemon games, the Pokemon's level is used as part of the damage calculation, and all of the multiplication and division rounds down. As a result, Pokemon damage ranges increase substantially when their levels end in 0, 3, 5, or 8. Now when I'm worried about tough opponents, I can just always go into the battles at these levels and never at like level 62 or like 64 or something like that. Just level up one more time and then have more damage. This also means that I don't have to test as many levels when I'm trying a fight to optimize it. Instead, I just test the next damage rounding threshold and then I go to the next one. That's it. This really speeds my production up and it helps so much knowing it in a playthrough. Now let's talk about the strangest thing that I've learned, and it's a glitch with how Hyper Beam works. By the way, this move is so broken in Generation 1, it is not just that it skips recharging, it's like, so janky. If the opponent has a status and is recharging on the turn that you use a sleep inflicting move, it will bypass accuracy checks, like Swift, and overwrite whatever status the recharging Pokemon currently has. Ah, it's so wonderfully weird. I've actually never seen this glitch in a playthrough, but I found out about it when I was researching a different glitch. Michael Pritchard asks, What's your most memorable moment while playing through Yellow and the Gen 2 games? In Yellow, the very first time I defeated the champion, and in Silver, when I accidentally released my Reiko. Veya asks a question about the stone evolutions, and I'm going to talk about those in a very fiery video very soon. Ami Chan asks, are you ever tired of Pokemon Yellow? I uh, thought I might be, but over the last two years, I've convinced myself that I'll be playing this game when I'm 60. Skeetermania asks, have you considered weaning somewhat off rest? I notice you tend to rely on this move a lot, even when the Pokemon using it clearly lacks the bulk to make use of the healing. Um, no, rest is great in Yellow. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, definitely not going to wean off this move. He also asks another question, which is why do you pronounce ex execute like you do with the emphasis on the second syllable rather than the first, like the word execute? Well, uh, look at it. It's a ex egg cute. So I really like to make sure that the egg part of the word is emphasized. After all, it's a uh, it's like a fake egg that's actually a seed. It's the weirdest thing ever. <laughs> this fog on. Anyways, next question. Ray Artemy asks, which runs results surprised you the most? Smeargle, one hundred percent Smeargle. He also asks which type was most let down by Gen 1's design decisions and quirks. For me, that's definitely the fighting type. Ghost and Dragon are good contenders, but they have good evolutionary lines, so I don't think they're that let down. Whereas Pokemon like Hitmonchan, Hitmonlee, Primeape, and Poliwrath, yeah, they really suffer because of their typing. So now I've made it to the league, and that's it for the question and answer portion of the video. If you like this sort of video, let me know in the comments below, or just uh, subscribe to the channel because I'm going to have to do another one of these when I hit 50k. Now, how will Jirachi do in the end game? Does this cutie have what it takes? Let's find out. Sydney's first. He leads with Mighty Anna, which immediately triggers Intimidate, lowering Jirachi's attack. That feels kinda bad, I wanted to use Hidden Power Bug here, maybe I'll just set up instead and use Thunderbolt. And then, Mighty Anna uses Sand Attack. Just great. Let's take this thing out with Hidden Power before it goes down again. Unfortunately, I only do half and get hit by another Sand Attack. Ugh, this is not going well. At least my next Hidden Power hits again. Shift Tree is next. While I try to knock it out, I just can't because it keeps setting up Double Team and my accuracy is already lowered. They really did choose to just put the most frustrating League member right at the beginning. I even got confused there to add insults to injury, but Jirachi snaps out, hits Hidden Power, and Shift Tree goes down. I miss once against Cacturn, it lowers my speed with Cotton Spore, and then I knock it out with Hidden Power. Okay, okay, I could do this. Crawdon's next. Okay, please Thunderbolt. Just connect. It does, and with that, it's gone. So all that's left is his ace, Absol. 
It goes for Sword Stance first turn. All right, that's raising the stakes. My Hidden Power misses. Absol uses Sword Stance again. And then Hidden Power hits. And it does so much, knocking the Dark Type out. I can't believe I got through that fight on the first attempt, even though I had awful play. By the way, a lot of you have commented that I should use the White Herb against Sydney, and I think this is a cool idea. I'll try it out very soon. Phoebe's next, and I'm pretty sure that I want to use Shadow Ball for this fight. Just in case I save before I teach it to Jirachi, now let's give this a try. I go for Shadow Ball against the first Dusclops. It does more than half. Dusclops hits with Shadow Punch for a small amount of damage, and my next Shadow Ball knocks it out. Phoebe sends out her Ace Dusclops next. Shadow Ball does half, and Dusclops uses Earthquake. Okay, that's a strange move for a ghost to know. A Citrus Berry heals it out of KO range, so I don't take it out on the next turn. Because of that, it gets another Earthquake in, and that takes Jirachi to 10 hit points. I do manage to take it out, but this position isn't good enough to win, and Jirachi ends up fainting. Okay, let's try that again. And then on the first turn, she sets up Curse with Dusclops. It does faint as a result, but that doesn't matter, because it can't knock out the second Dusclops fast enough. So, that's another loss. I didn't expect Phoebe to be a challenge. I've saved my rare candies until this point, so I might as well use some here. But how many is the right number? I'll get the largest boosts to my damage at level 53 and level 55, because of how damage rounding works. I decide to use 3 rare candies to get both boosts to my damage. Alright, that should make a difference. Just like Pelipper, Dusclops loves to troll with Protect on the first turn. After that, it decides to actually play the game with Shadow Punch, but it does very little and I knock it out. Oh, uh, wait, sorry, it uses Protect again, and then I knock it out. So, I made it to the second Dusclops without Curse, but can I survive the Earthquakes? Shadow Ball does more than half now, and that's what I needed. Even after a Citrus Berry, I still knock it out on the next turn. Bayonet number one is next, and I one hit with Shadow Ball. She sends in Sableye, I decide to use Calm Mind here, but as I watch this footage, I see Sableye setting up double team. I really should have just attacked. Still, Jirachi aims correctly, and Thunderbolt knocks the ghost out. So that's it, unless the Bayonet survives, but it's pretty weak, and so I take it out on the next turn. The next fight against Glacia really feels like the fight against Lorelei and Pokemon Yellow. Here, Seal is the Dugong stand-in, because it provides the perfect opportunity for me to set up. After getting Calm Minds in, I can use Rest, Heal Paralysis, which functions as intended in this game so my speed is restored. After I wake up, things get electric because our intimidating Pokemon fall one after another. So that's it for the Ice Master. So far, she was the easiest member of the league. So I mentioned how Glacia felt like Lorelei because I could set up on her first Pokemon. Well, uh, Drake feels like that too, because he has a shell gone, and he just loves to use Protect and sit there and do nothing. While the dragon is hunkering down and stalling, Dreshi gets really calm, makes a wish, and then starts to unleash Havoc. Shellgon's a one-hit, Flygon hits a massive earthquake, but Jirachi survives, and Psychic gets the KO. Now, I'm wondering if the Rock Tombs from Shellgon are going to spell the end for me. Salamence moves first with Flamethrower, but Calm Mind prevents so much damage, and Jirachi gets to rest. And then the next Flamethrower that the dragon gets crits and takes me down to red health. Ugh, so that's it. Okay, so that's a frustrating way to lose, but I can repeat this strategy again because Salamence is not going to critical hit this time. As predicted, it doesn't, and with that, I've won. All that's left now is Wallace. Makes sense, because he's a water type trainer and there's too much water in this generation. But in this case I have Thunderbolt, so this shouldn't be too bad. Wailord's first. I go for Calm Mind to set up, it uses Blizzard, which does so little. Okay, I'm not scared here anymore. I can set up for free. For whatever reason, Wailord prioritizes double edge against my steel type. I guess that's because I'm setting up my special defense. Either way, it's uh, really not a strong play. With full setup, I'm now prepared for the sweep. Thunderbolt takes the Wailord out, Wishcash falls to Psychic, and then I use Thunderbolt against the Gyarados. Obviously, it's a one-hit. Tentacruel, Ludicolo, and Milotic all follow, and that's it. Jirachi beat Wallace with a time of 2 hours, 18 minutes, and 6 seconds, with 7 resets at level 59, and a game time of 8 hours and 23 minutes. However, the game's not over yet. Hoenn's ultimate test is last. It's time to face Steven. Can this mythical Pokemon do it on its first attempt? Let's find out.
Steven leads with Skarmory. Its moveset is toxic aerial ace, spikes, and steel wing, so it doesn't have anything that threatens Jirachi. That's really nice because it gives me time to set up Calm Mind as much as I want. With a full setup, I decide to use Rest to heal, and then I have the best possible chance of defeating his remaining Pokemon. Jirachi wakes up, I choose Thunderbolt, it takes Skarmory down in a single hit, and next is Claydol. So I don't have a move that's particularly good against this thing because it's a ground Psychic type. So Psychic's my best bet. It does half, Claydol sets up Reflect, which basically does nothing, and then I knock it out with my next Psychic. It's time for Agron. I go for Psychic again, and it's another one hit. Oh wait, it survives with just a sliver? Are you kidding me? It retaliates with Earthquake, doing two times damage to Jirachi, and that finishes me off. Okay, so I was attempting this fight at level 59. With one level more, I can get over the next damage rounding threshold, so this is going to be easier. Skarmory still isn't an issue. Apparently, Claydol just really wants to set up Reflect, and now I'm facing the Aggron again. Alright, damage rounding, let's take this thing out. But once again, Psychic fails to get the KO, leaving Aggron with a sliver. It uses Earthquake, but this time Jirachi survives. Steven uses a full restore, replenishing Aggron's health, and then my next Psychic gets the KO. So, I guess it's a roll at this level. That's pretty unfortunate, but I'm happy to be proceeding. Next is Steven's Metagross. If I use Rest, it's probably going to KO me with Earthquake, but I'm really not confident that Thunderbolt is going to be able to take it out. Maybe Calm Mind will allow me to do it. I cross my fingers, well, not actually because I'm playing the game. I go for Thunderbolt, but Metagross survives and knocks Jirachi out with Meteor Mash. By the way, that move has like the coolest name. Not as cool as Doom Desire, of course, but uh, that move is bad. Okay, so I really need to take less damage from physical attacks in order to make this fight easier, so I can add Reflect to Jirachi's moveset to accomplish this. I'm used to playing in Generation 1 where Reflect lasts indefinitely, but now I have to re-establish it every time it wears off. With enough planning and stalling against the Skarmory, I'm able to move on to Steven's next Pokémon with Reflect established. However, for whatever reason, Claydol sets up Light Screen this time, which is really annoying. I manage to take it out, however, Reflect wears off when Aggron hits the field. So I try to establish it again, but the Steel Rock Titan crits and knocks Drachi out anyways. In the next battle, everything finally goes according to plan. Claydol uses Reflect instead of Light Screen, and Psychic 1 hits Aggron. It's time for the Metagross again. Unfortunately, Reflect wears off right before Metagross hits the field, and so I'm left making the tough decision between setting up Reflect or attacking with Psychic. I choose to go for Reflect, Earthquake really doesn't do that much to me now, and then I strike back with Psychic. Alright, that actually did a decent amount. About a third. But Metagross finishes me off with Earthquake on the next turn. <sighs> okay, so this fight's not going well. I thought maybe Reflect was a bad choice because now I don't have Thunderbolt. However, then Metagross can just knock me out with a single hit from Earthquake. So that won't work either. It's definitely time to train. While I was doing this in Victory Road, Leary mentioned to me that maybe we should try to use Secret Power because when the player has it in a cave, it functions similarly to Bite. It's still a 70 base power normal type move, however it has a 30% chance to make the opponent flinch. If I'm able to cause the Metagross to flinch at least once, maybe twice, I can probably do this. I head to Slateport, buy the TM, and then I teach Secret Power to Jirachi. Let's see if this will help. For whatever reason, I start using Secret Power against Steven's Claydol. He just switches it out and sends Agron in instead. Alright, apparently he learned a few lessons from Kanto's jugglers. Because then, he sends in Metagross, and he gets hit by Thunderbolt for free. Oh, nice, I got a critical hit. So, that's lucky. As a result, I think that this is gonna be it. Secret Power causes Claydol to flinch, it does a little, and then I tank an Earthquake, and my next Secret Power isn't quite enough. That allows Claydol to knock Jirachi out with Earthquake. Ah, it's so painful losing against this thing. Especially when I knock the Metagross out. So, uh, are you ready for the pain? I lose to the Metagross, I lose to the Claydol. Alright, I think that I need another approach. So I head back to the beach from the early game and collect a Heart Scale. With it, I'm able to use the Move Reminder to give Jirachi back Cosmic Power. I decided to replace Calm Mind here so that I could keep both Psychic and Thunderbolt, as well as Rest for the fight because I think that those moves are all going to be useful. Once again, Skarmory provides me the perfect opportunity to fully set up, and this time my defenses are maxed. Now, this should be enough to defeat Steven. Unfortunately, without the setup from Calm Mind, I'm doing almost nothing to the Claydol, and this gives it the opportunity to hit with Earthquake. Each one of them is doing very little, however the issue is now, the longer this goes on, the more chance he has to get a critical hit. Finally he gets it, and that takes Jirachi out. So. That's really frustrating. Oh, and then immediately after this, Agron crits and knocks Jirachi out too. Are you kidding me? I guess not, because Agron crits again in the next fight. Ah, 
crits really do help balance out stall tactics. One of the issues I'm having here is that rest doesn't really allow me to heal fast enough, but I can use the move reminder to get wish instead. With it, the flavor of Jirachi is starting to come back into this playthrough. I take the Skarmory out, Claydol hits the field. I'm gonna need to knock this thing out slowly with secret power. It does set up both screens because I don't flinch it enough, but still I'm able to heal and move on to the Aggron. I go for Thunderbolt, it is just under half, Aggron strikes with Earthquake, which luckily doesn't get a crit this time. My next Thunderbolt takes it to red, doesn't crit, and right before I knock it out, Steven uses a full restore. Uh, I manage to get Paralysis with my next Thunderbolt, I use Wish to heal, and then Drachi gets a critical hit. Okay, my turn. It's time for Metagross. Wish heals me to full, and with all my cosmic powers, I think that I can do this. This is gonna be it. I go for secret power, it does so little, but at least it makes Metagross flinch. I try again, take some damage from Earthquake, and then I decide to go for Thunderbolt. Metagross recovers with the Citrus Berry, Steven uses a full restore, so I decide to take my time using Wish, which is very scary because Steven has been getting a lot of critical hits. In the end though, I manage to take his ace out. Next is Cradley. It's the first time that I've got here in this playthrough, and then check this out. After Cradley sets up Ingrain, I'm dealing almost no damage to it. So yeah, it used to be the fact that I was the one stalling Steven out, and now he's stalling me out. Watch this now. The footage is gonna go really fast, so uh, yeah, there's gonna be some flashing lights on screen. Apparently this moveset isn't enough either. I need a solution for the Cradley now. Unfortunately, even with having depleted all my PP and starting struggle, I'm not doing enough damage to take it out, and Jirachi knocks itself out with recoil. Okay, so I was successful struggling against the Puchiana and against Tate and Liza, but not here against Steven. So yeah, guess how I solved Steven. And this is actually why I made this video and didn't just refilm it with my new overlay. It's gonna be extremely ironic because what if toxic is the answer here? I cannot believe that I'm even entertaining this idea to use a poison type move against the steel type master. Also with my steel type mythical Pokemon. What is this game? I figured here that the extra turns would actually help Toxic and I wouldn't get stalled out like I was before. However, now I can't heal fast enough against Pokemon that know Earthquake, and so Aggron takes me down. Let's face Steven with Toxic, Thunderbolt, Wish, and Cosmic Power. This moveset is quite weird. I can set up fully on the Skarmory, max out my defense, heal with Wish, and then move on to the Claydol. Against it, I don't need an attacking move because I can poison it with Toxic and use Wish in combination with Cosmic Power to buy time until it faints. I don't think that I can lose here even if it gets a crit. Aggron's next, and luckily this thing isn't a ground type, so I can use Thunderbolt to knock it out. Steven does use a full restore, buying some time, but my next Thunderbolt crits and that's it. Metagross time. Because its earthquakes aren't doing very much, I can alternate between Wish and Thunderbolt. While the strategy does take time, eventually Steven's ace falls. Now it's time for the Cradley. Toxic is here just so I can defeat this thing. No matter how much it uses Ingrain or Giga Drain, eventually the damage stacks up too high and it goes down. Last is Armaldo. Uh, this uh, rock, bug, steel, ground type thing, I guess, is no issue for Jirachi to manage. And with that, I've done it. I beat Pokemon Emerald with only a Jirachi. It clocks in with a time of 3 hours, 25 minutes, and 13 seconds, with 21 resets at level 66. And all of this took 9 hours and 53 minutes of game time. I really cannot believe this playthrough. Ridiculous things happened. It all started with the inability to knock out a Poochiena. <laughs> There was a giant stall fest against Tate and Liza, and then the concluding battle against Steven was one of the most interesting fights that I've ever had to solve. Leary and I really struggled to figure out exactly how to do it, but in the end, it truly seemed that the Steel-type defeated the Steel-type master with Toxic. Thanks to my patrons for their support, my patron Pokedex is filling up so much that we might actually complete the Johto portion of the decks very soon. Maybe we can do that before the end of the year. Like, subscribe, ring the Chimeco, and comment because I gotta read them all. If you made it this far, you're incredible. Now it's bloopers time. So now let's get into some of the questions. So now as I so now as I make my way towards So now as I make So now as I make oh, Her Ace nose pass is last. Her ace nose pass her ace nose pass is last. La oh, come on. Sharpen is good because it triggers the badge boost glitch six times as well as raising your attack stat. Statch, yes. I also completed but the but the, dis, the dispensal drop. Yeah, no, not that. Since I don't have access to water pulse yet, I don't have anything that's super effective. Oh, gosh. oh that burp, the worst, always gets me. I still have my re I still have my chesto burial, chesto burial. Yes. Something else, as you will have noticed, noticed. Yes. 
such as ones that add a future Pokemon for a hypothetical person. <sighs> Wishcash is next. Whiskash is next. Whiskers. Whiskash. Phoebe's next. I was pretty sure I wanted to use Shadow Ball for this fight, but at the last Mimit... Mimit, yes. It does make it faint, but that doesn't matter because I can't knock out the Ses... Ses I don't know. Next is Steven's Metagross. If I use Refre Refresh, yes. With it, the Jirachi play... With it, the flavor of Jirachi is starting to come back into this play playthrough. With it, the flavor of Jirachi is starting to come back into this playthrough. Ah, burp. Stop ruining my lines, burps. In the 8 Palm video, which immediately preceded it, I was experimenting with adding in bloopers into the main video so that I could... My script here says so that I could aspirate the league. <laughs> like, that's not what I meant. <laughs> I definitely did not mean that. Okay, what did I mean? Aspirate the league. I don't know what I meant. <laughs> Anyways. 